Hello and welcome to Tatvadeep Conversations and Explorations. For our third episode on language, we sat down with Professor Mitchell Green. Professor Green is a professor of philosophy at the University of Connecticut and has also worked at the University of Virginia, the University of Munster, and Singapore Management University. His research is focused in the philosophy of language, the philosophy of mind, and aesthetics, and his interests have recently ranged into the nature of self-knowledge, the evolution of communication, and issues in environmental philosophy. In addition to publishing about 80 articles or book chapters, Professor Green has published five books, Engaging Philosophy, A Brief Introduction, Moore's Paradox with John Williams, Self-Expression, Know Thyself, The Value and Limits of Self-Knowledge, and most recently, The Philosophy of Language. We talked about the role language plays in how we represent ourselves to ourselves and the world at large, how language empowers us, helps us define who we are and what we believe in. We discussed how language is directed by society and social norms and the interplay between language and thoughts and language and emotions. We also talked about what silence means to him, along with some of the questions he hopes the upcoming generation of linguists would look into. We hope this conversation can help the listeners see the tattva or the true essence of their own mother tongue along with the values and meanings embedded within the structures of the different languages of our world and their strong interconnectedness. Hello, Professor Green. Welcome to Tattva Deep. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Oh, we're very, very happy to have you here with us. So. Um, I think we'll just get started with the, I've prepared a bunch of questions uh, to, help under, to help me understand language a little better and to learn it from you. So, uh, Professor Green, as you would know, uh, since we started Tatwadeep, we have been sharing, sending emails to a lot of educators, teachers, experts, professors, right, to get in touch with them and see if they have the time that they would be willing to share with us. So in, we've been getting very cordial responses from people, even when they don't have the time to, uh, you know, join us. So I felt like your emails, uh, for me personally, stood out in some sense. And uh, it was the first time ever we exchanged just a couple of emails, uh, but it stood out for its, I could sense uh, there, was a, there was a sense of warmth and uh, humility in your email, but that's what I sensed. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I started to wonder that this is written language. This is not spoken language. This is the first time we're talking now. But language in this case, do you think it's the best way that we have human beings to represent ourselves to the world at large? Is it the best way? I'm not sure I'd go so far as to say that it's the best way in general. I think there are lots of ways of representing ourselves. So for example, pictorial representation is another way of representing ourselves mm. to ourselves and to the world at large. Mm. Sounds that we make, for example, through music are also very powerful ways of representing ourselves. Mm. So I think that pictures, sounds, for example, as well as language are all different ways of doing so. I don't know how we would go about establishing that one is better than the others until we had some clear agreement on what counts as doing better in one respect or another. That is to say, they're different, but I'm not sure I'd wanna say one is better than the other. And therefore I'm not sure I'd wanna say that language is the best way we have because mm -hmm. to say it's the best involves a relative judgment of these other, these other media. So it seems to me that language is really, really good for certain things planning complex coordinated behaviors, for example, mm -hmm. and making records of historical events, and possibly also as a means for carrying out complex uh, trains of reasoning, mm -hmm. where you've got, got arguments that require, you know, specifically formulated premises, and we try to go from those to some kind of conclusion. Language is very good for those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But for, for example, representing and also expressing things like emotions, and aspects of our experience, language is often weaker than pictorial and musical representation can be. And so if you want to 
tell somebody or indicate more precisely convey to someone how you feel about a situation, for example. Mm -hmm. It's not clear to me that language, certainly spoken, certainly written language, is not the best way. It might have powers, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, sound, visual imagery might have powers that written language lacks. And I should say spoken language has many characteristics that are often kind of mashed together. It's got representation of the sort you find in written language, but you also, generally speaking, with spoke, spoken language have intonation. Mm. You've got the, the, the prosody, that is the speed at which you, you say various things. Sometimes you say things slower, sometimes you faster, sometimes you have breaks. Those can have expressive elements as well, and therefore can be emotions. And also, spoken language is often, usually I'd say, carried out face-to-face, -face, mm. in which case it's supported by the, the, the communicative power of facial expressions. So, so written language has a power that other forms of communication, generally speaking, and on the whole lack, but that does not itself make it in any way a better system of communication than others, simply because, for example, pictures have a power that written language lacks, but that shouldn't make us say that pictures are more powerful. It just depends on what job you want to do, what it is that you're trying to achieve. Hmm, right. So what would you, according to you, what constitutes language then? What is language? Well, there are many different ways of thinking about this. Mm. Scholars in my area, which is philosophy of language, mm. and in my understanding, generally speaking, linguistics as well, mm. would define language sometimes in a narrow way, sometimes in a broader way. Mm. I would generally want to define communication as a very broad phenomenon. Mm. Communication is something that birds can participate in and uh, uh, dolphins and, and probably even uh, less sophisticated creatures such as earthworms and ants and so forth. Um, mm. But most people who study these things would say that non-human animals, as far as, we don't, so, as far as we know, do not have a language. Mm. And, there, and the reason is that to have a language, many would say, you have to have a system of representation that has, this is a little bit technical, but the idea is that it's got a recursive syntax mm. and a compositional semantics. Mm. Where recursive syntax means roughly the following. For any sentence that you take, mm. you can make it more complicated by adding a couple more phrases to it. For example, mm. think about a sentence that, can, that contains a pre prepositional phrase. John carried the ball over the bridge. Mm. You could also add to it by saying, John carried the ball over the bridge with an apple in his hand. Mm -hmm. And John carried a ball over the bridge with an apple in his hand after brushing his teeth. Mm -hmm. And you just go on like that for as long as you mm -hmm. want to. You can keep mm -hmm. on re 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 reiterating the operator that made the original sentence mm -hmm. and doing it again. Recursion is the idea of mm -hmm. reapplying a, an operation to a sentence or to anything really uh, to make it more complicated. And language with the, in the syntax, that is the grammar of language, we have this recursive power that is not found, as far as we know, in other communicative systems. We also have, and when I talk about syntax, I mean, essentially, the grammatical structure of a sentence, whether you've got a noun phrase here, a verb phrase there, mm. whether they form an indicative sentence or an interrogative sentence used for asking questions or an imperative sentence used for making commands. And that's different. All that, all that sort of stuff is different from semantics, which has to do with meaning. Meaning. So, see, for me, uh, Professor Green, I don't have a, I'm not a linguist, I'm not a philosopher of language, but um, um, both uh, me and my husband, we take language seriously, like we can mm -hmm. definitely get into what that means, but we take it seriously, we think and we speak for, for one thing, right? Mm -hmm. So another thing, in order to do research for my, um, um, uh, you know, these discussions on language, I went to certain mm -hmm. films. Films really break things down for us. You know, they make it simple. It's a storyline you can follow. So this one mm -hmm. film we watched, it's called uh, mm -hmm. Arrival. Uh, have you heard of it? Arrival, it came out in I have not seen Arrival, but I've read about it. Okay. That's the basic idea of arrival, yeah. So there was like, um, um, what happened in that was in order to understand language, they, the premise was this, that you are teaching the language that you speak in order to commun mm -hmm. communicate with a species that does not speak your language. So right. the bridge had to be built by the linguist, uh, right. an American linguist with these aliens, right, right who don't right. speak your language. So right. what she said was, in order to explain it to other people on board, you know, in the team, that why is she, why is she using uh, grade school words? Why is she, uh, you know, first trying to tell what their name mm -hmm. is, what their names are? So mm -hmm. why she, she explained it with the example of a sentence? Because the fundamental ex uh, 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 quest was to understand why these people have come. 
That was the quest. Right. Now right. she says, into, and explaining this sentence, she broke it down into units, as you were saying. She broke it mm -hmm. down into units, and the units contain meaning. So she said, when you ask them, why are you here? We need mm -hmm. to know if in their language, something like a why, does it even exist? Or are the right. decisions so impulsive that they don't un right. even understand the uh, word why? And then it is mm -hmm. your, why have, sorry, why have you, you as in not one, there were eight alien ships, spaceships, or for the lack mm -hmm. of a better word. So she's not mm -hmm. talking to one of them. She wants to talk to them, but she, uh, she she's uh, addressing one of them, but she wants to know the goal of the whole, all of them, why they have come. Right. So how she is breaking it. So I think that's what you're trying to say, that language, mm -hmm. the meaning light lies in the individual units and how they kind of come together to then form right. a, uh, something that you can interpret in the world. So this right. inter interpretation seems to be where we tend to lose each other, right? If we're going to lose each other anywhere at the level of understanding, it's in a failure of interpretation generally. Right, because if, if you're writing an email to me or if you're talking to me, you're using the same words that are falling into my ears. You say mm -hmm. from the point of hoping that you will, you will be able to be as clear as you can be in conveying right. yourself. And, right. uh, and maybe your second hope is that I will understand you for what you're saying. But then that, why has it come to this? How has it come to this? Why, even when we're speaking the same language? Mm -hmm. Why do you think there is such poor interpretation that we have phrases like read between the lines? You have lines, mm -hmm. read the lines, understand from the lines. No, 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 read between the lines. So what is it oh, this see. hiding in the showing in that's happening, that language we're doing with language? What's going on? Here? I see that. Yeah, that's a good question. I guess I'd say there are a number of different possibilities there. Often people try to communicate things that go beyond what they literal, literally say. That is, for example, read between the lines is often a suggestion that the person you're trying to communicate with is failing to get a message you're trying to convey, but you're not trying to convey it by saying it explicitly. So if I tell somebody to read, to read between the lines, I'm generally going to perhaps be frustrated about the fact that I'm trying to convey something without quite saying it. And so I'm hoping that they'll have the sensitivity to figure out that I'm that I have something in mind that I'd rather not actually put in words or in a letter or something like that, right? And mm. so the idea is that, as I understand the phrase "read between the lines," it's an injunction to our the person that we're communicating with to be a little bit more subtle in their interpretation of what I mean that goes beyond what I actually say. Mm. Mm. And that's a very common phenomenon, and for the most part, we're pretty good at that. So you know, if we're at a store together and you're trying on a a hat or something and you say how does this hat look and I say let's try something else mm. you'll probably figure out that I don't think that hat looks so great or something of the sort right but I didn't say it I just mm. said let's try something else it's not part of what I said not part of the meaning of my utterance and we depend upon each other to read between those lines very often but because these things are implicit rather than explicit it's a sort of occupational hazard it comes with the territory of communicating in these relatively unspecified and subtle ways that people sometimes fail to figure out what it is they're trying to convey and that takes a certain amount of sensitivity subtlety and willingness to put yourself in the shoes of the other person the other speaker for example and trying to figure out what they might be communicating to figure out what you should interpret and that's a relatively sophisticated intellectual cognitive act for example children under the age of five are known to be not very good at detecting those pragmatic aspects of meaning. Yeah. Often they take your metaphors literally, for example, yeah. and don't yeah. understand because of that. Yeah. So, so linguists and philosophers of language spend a lot of time figuring out the process by which we attempt to convey more than we literally say. And part of that explanation brings with it the prediction that if someone doesn't understand the mechanism, they might not actually understand the output as well. And I'm sure you've been in situations in which you're trying to convey something to somebody without saying it, and they it goes right by them. Yeah, it happens yeah. a lot. But I think, I guess my point is, it happens a lot in a way that should be so surprising, because it depends upon a fairly sophisticated cognitive machinery for it to occur well. Right, right. And then... Um... What we right now gave, uh, what you gave right now was slightly simpler examples, like, uh, you know, how does the hat look? Well, let's yeah. try another one, you know, right. uh, maybe you can try the blue one, whatever. So these are slightly simpler examples. But what happens when, uh, say, on a, on a political level, right, when you can't 
I you you should you can't afford to lose out on the real meaning on what is being said because decisions are being made on a very large right. level. So do you think right. there is an unspoken agreement that we, we all understand, people from all cultures understand, and then like is there something like this that we understand this happened? You're implying, but you mean something else, and I get it. Or, or the, uh, do you think it's culturally driven and it's a part of our evolution of language that we've come to talk in this way? And is it also because we, we think that people are too sensitive to take the truth and that we don't know how to speak the truth? What is causing, I think, I think there are two questions here, right? One thing was to understand, can this, uh, uh, this our faith in the other person understanding what we imply work on a really large level? the level of a uh, global level and second right. how have we come to this point where we where we trust uh, implying more than speaking the truth right and as to the first question i would not be very confident that this faith is justified at the global level that is to say it seems to me it's a little bit rash to suppose that you and i who are from very different cultures mm. could succeed in communicating these unspoken but still intended things that go beyond the literal meaning of our words. We share English, for example, so we can speak that, but if, and if we're being very literal, it should generally speaking not be a problem. But there may well be cases in which I try to imply something that depends upon a background knowledge that I don't know that you have. And likewise, you could try to imply something to me that depends upon a background knowledge that I wouldn't have. So I would say, I would in general suggest that we get, tread very carefully in the area of that pragmatic side of communication that goes, be, that goes beyond the literal words. Mm. If you ask the question, this is about your second question, where do we, how do we get here? What is, what is the reason why we, we do this, this kind of thing where we mean more, th more than we literally say? I would say to some extent, it's a matter of the ways in which the norms of communication, which we try to be clear and direct and so forth, sometimes are in tension with another norm, which has to do with politeness. Mm -hmm. And so we want to be clear, we want to communicate our ideas, but sometimes we also realize that doing so might make other people embarrassed or annoyed, et cetera. And so we often put what we say in ways that are a little bit more ambiguous that they don't necessarily feel like we're being critical, for example. So instead of criticizing someone directly, we might say, let's try something else, let's try a different approach and so forth, whereby we can redirect their behavior without explicitly criticizing them. So um, many scholars talk about the notion of face, which mm -hmm. for example, is a very big concept in Chinese culture. So in face, there's a sort of your reputation, your standing in the community. And if somebody is too critical of you, you have a chance, there's the danger that you might lose face, that you have loss of face is an important thing for many cultures. And that I would say is one mechanism or one driver one pressure that causes us to often be less explicit than we would like to be if the only thing that mattered were saying the truth and being clear we would be a lot more potentially critical of one another than mm -hmm. our than our expectations would normally lead us lead us to do um, but because we we try to take into account one another's feelings one another's social status and so forth we often do catch, catch our words in ways that, that are often a little more ambiguous a little bit less specific so that somebody might as it were take the hint without being called out in public especially if there's someone else around yeah so it seems to me there are reasons why we are we often use these pragmatic mechanisms but those reasons are don't have to do just with just with the fact that we're trying to convey information, they also have to do with the fact that we're social beings that have a status and emotions and we try to protect those for our own well-being as well as the well-being of the community. I understand. I understand. I tend to see language as sort of a shield. I also, that we kind of can hold against the world. And I also see it as a sort of a mirror, which we can hold against ourselves if we know how to keep that difference and know what the mirror shows us and we know how to use that shield effectively right. of course it's a matter of practice like language we are born into a language that we speak but we all we end up taking it so for granted especially if you never venture right. out of your small little town or you know the, the place you were born in and your language wasn't suddenly challenged you just take it for granted and it's amazing. So uh, another thing I would like to ask you is, so there is this, we, we, when, we, uh, when we think of linguists, when we think of philosophers of language, we see, we tend to think of them as working on uh, language. We tend to think of uh, them working on what makes up a language, you know, uh, how language, the history, origins of language. What about but? What about the language of the mind? Now, uh, I mean, thoughts. 
I'm talking about thoughts. Now, sometimes I've noticed, I'll give you a personal example. Uh, like uh, you can say six, seven years ago, uh, I would realize that the thoughts in my head, I would have, everybody has thoughts. You're talking to someone, you have something to say, right? The arrangement of speech, the orderliness of speech was often missing in the language of my thought, if I can call it the language of thought. So what happens here? Like, but with time, I've also noticed that uh, if somebody is asking me a question now, after eight years of practicing how to speech, take myself seriously, you know, take language speak seriously, know that it has consequences, what you speak, you know, you, you bring things into uh, reality. So after taking, becoming a little more conscious about it, I have noticed now there's a huge shift. Now the orderliness is very swift in the mind. And like if you're if someone is asking me something, I might have an answer very quickly here. It might take me 15 minutes to explain it in a well articulated manner. But here mm -hmm. it's snap. So it's maybe we uh, it's a it's a, a neuro question we should pose ask a neuroscientist or something. But do you have any thoughts on it? Like, what is this language of the mind? In what way does it differ from the language of speech, language of uh, in which we write? It's a complicated but interesting question. Let me just say a couple of things about it. One of them is there is a reasonably well studied phenomenon known as inner speech. Mm -mm. And in inner speech, according to neuroscientists and psychologists, a normal adults will engage in inner speech about 25% of their waking life. And that, is, that includes things like, you know, you go into a grocery store and you say to yourself, well, I better go, go get, get some of this kind of product and so get some of that. And you say things to yourself, or you just had a conversation with somebody and the, some of the conversations are reverberating in your mind. And you might say to yourself, the sentence, the, the, the statement that you wanted to have made that you forgot to say or something of the sort. Mm -hmm. So we engage in inner speech. And as I understand it, that inner speech is generally similar to the syntax and semantics of the language that you are fluent in, so assuming that there's just one language that you're fluent in. Um, that is to say that inner speech is a part of our consciousness and those inner speech episodes often precede what we say overtly to other people, but they don't have to. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But my point is just that inner speech episodes seem to have a structure very similar to that of overt public speech. And it is certainly part of our experience for most of us that we engage in inner speech. It's more interesting when someone is, for example, fluent in more than one language, because sometimes they might find themselves speaking in one language and then speaking in another language in the privacy of their own thoughts. That's an interesting phenomenon. Um, but the other, the other aspect of speech production that psycholinguists study, and that's not an area in which I have expertise, but psycholinguists also study the, the production of speech in everyday conversation. And my understanding is that they will generally say that when we're, as it were, lining up phrases before we actually open our mouths and say something, that process of constructing phrases and then into whole sentences and so forth, generally speaking, doesn't occur at the conscious level. That is to say, it's not something that goes on in consciousness, but something that happens at, a, at an unconscious level. It's still a mental process, but it's unconscious in the way in which when you see a sentence written out and you understand it, the process of understanding is generally speaking, not something you're conscious of, at least in a language that you're fluent in. If it's language that you're learning, that you have, then you have to engage in the conscious, often very difficult process of trying to figure out where's the noun, where's the verb, how do they fit together, and so forth. But in the language that you know and are, and are comfortable with, that's usually a process that does not go, that's not part of conscious awareness. And so we sometimes have, a, have the idea intuitively before we start studying language that when you speak with someone, first you, at, the, at some conscious level, line up a sentence in your mind, and then you say it out loud to the other person, but that constructing of a sentence in your mind is not something generally speaking that happens in a way that's accessible to consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that uh, this great amount of time that we spend having these inner dialogues, those are the things that we speak out when we are spoken to. And because so sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes, but not always, mm -hmm. often what happens is that when you say something to me and I respond, and it's a response that makes sense and corresponds to what I think and so forth. It's not the case that I have to engage in inner speech before responding to you. Hmm. So if you ask me a question to which I feel, feel pretty confident to know the answer, I could engage in inner speech 
but it would take a bit of time. And every day, real-time conversation happens much faster than that process would allow. Mm -hmm. So my point is rather that probably in most cases in which one person responds to what somebody else says, what somebody else says, it's in real time, perhaps, for, for example, it might be face-to-face -face or over Zoom like we are, there's not the intermediary step of an inner speech utterance that goes on in the privacy of your mind as you prepare to say something out loud to the other person. It's just rather the sentence just comes right out. There is some preparation for what you say that constructs the sentence, but that doesn't happen at the conscious level. Whereas in your speech episodes, when you say things to yourself in the privacy of your thoughts, that is generally something that is conscious. So, so my point is, hmm. go ahead. Okay. Uh, if you have more to say to complete your thought, because I, I do get it, but if you have something more to say, please go ahead. Yeah, just to, just, just to be clear, the inner speech episodes, that experience we have when we're saying things to ourselves is interestingly and perhaps even strangely less connected than you might have thought to everyday real-time spoken discourse because everyday real-time spoken discourse is more spontaneous, more offhand, more immediate than the inner speech episodes would really allow for given the amount of time that they normally take. We often have inner, you know, conversations back and forth with each other, especially among family members, people who know each other and so forth that are super fast, extremely quick, and you just wouldn't have time to engage in the inner speech episodes before producing sentences at the rate that normally people do. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of two streams. There's mm -hmm. the conscious inner speech episodes, that's mm -hmm. just when you're ruminating, and then there's the stuff, you, the sentence you produce, probably mostly at the unconscious level, when you're in real-time conversations, and they seem very different. Right, right. And even here, I see two more strains, which is one when you're speaking with strangers and one when you're speaking with people you know. And so there is a lot of uh, knowledge exchange. You know the person. If I'm talking to my father, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the times I'm completing his sentences. There's a lot of comfort level. Yeah. When you're speaking to a That's stranger, right. you have to kind of, uh, you know, uh, maybe, yeah, it takes time to find your feet. That's right. And you also have to think on your feet. You also have to, so it's a matter of practice is what I've learned. If you want to be mm -hmm. heard clearly, if you want to be understood well, uh, it's a matter of practice, you know, uh, speaking with strangers. Like I try, but I'm speaking to you for the first time, but uh, the, the, the hesitancy has kind of left me. Thank, thankfully, even when I'm speaking with strangers, you know, so my key is that's for me, what drives is a genuine curiosity. So even if I make a mistake, yeah, I don't have the knowledge. That's why I'm speaking to someone like you. So uh, do you think the, having that kind of a crutch or a, or, 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 or a, or a mental spine in, in some sense to, to fall back on, uh, even when you're talking to strangers, can help you construct your sentences and your thoughts a little better? Yeah, and do absolutely. you have those tools uh, personally, anything that you use to, uh, to no be able to... Con that's, that's a very common phenomenon. Scholars in my area talk often about the notion of a common ground. That's a sort of important concept in contemporary linguistics and philosophy of language, the idea of common ground. And common ground is those, that set of assumptions that we, not only if you and I have a common ground, it's not only their set of assumptions that you and I share, mm. but it's also assumptions that you and I are aware that the other one shares. Mm -hmm. So you and I both know, might, might have read the same article in the newspaper this morning, but neither of us knows that the other one has, has read the same article. And so we can't presuppose it. Whereas you and I both know that, for example, you know, the capital of France is, is Paris. And so we can presume that and smoothly do so in our conversations. People from very different cultures might not have very much common ground. And linguists have shown that that makes conversation more challenging because there are fewer things you can take for granted. Conversation runs smoothly when we can have a lot of things that we take for granted. If I sit up, if I sit next to a complete stranger on a bus in a country I've never been to before, even if I know that they speak my language, it's going to be challenging to figure out how to have a conversation with them. I don't know what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, what I can talk about, they'll have understanding and they won't know about me. It takes a lot of time to sort of sniff the person out as it were, to try to figure out what if any common ground we have. Then once we have established some common ground, then we can start having a reasonable conversation. But it can be very challenging to get that basis. And that's why people often talk about, you know, weather, 
sports, things like that. Yeah. They try not to be too not to be too explicit about politics because that can be a difficult conversation for people if they're on different sides of things. Um, but that common ground is an important factor in determining how smoothly conversation goes. I'm sure you've got an enormous amount of conversation, sorry, common ground with your father, for example, which makes conversation between you and him very easy. And that's why you can finish his sentences before he gets, before he's able to do so. And that's the case with the 10 or 15 or 20 people that we most, most of us have in our lives that we know extremely well. Outside of that, it gets much more challenging. But but of, you'll also agree that sometimes, even with your loved ones, conversation can get difficult. In fact, it can get sure. more difficult because, because uh, I, I am unable to see language um, without the presence of emotions. You can control them. You can certainly control them. And I, I also believe that language plays a huge, huge role in helping you articulate your emotions better to yourselves, better to someone else. And I think that also paves the way for a more cleaner, more open conversation. But even with family, like uh, I, I'm sure you've heard of um, uh, cases where family members haven't spoken to each other for years because of some misunderstanding. And then it's not like they don't want to solve it, but they just do not know how. Mm -hmm. And what this has, sh this shows me that uh, language, we've started taking language seriously. And I think it's, it's a fairly recent phenomenon, language as a science, you know, linguistics yeah. is a fairly yeah. recent phenomenon, just maybe a couple of centuries, maybe 200 years, if I'm not wrong. Maybe. Well, there were many ancient scholars, both in the Western tradition and, for example, in the, Indian, in the tradition of classical India, that took language very seriously in the sense of grammar. So there are grammarians, yeah. Yeah. yeah, grammarians that go back millennia mm -hmm. that studied language in that way. And I don't know their work well enough to be able to, to discuss them with any kind of specificity, but I do think language has been a subject of interest for many cultures for many thousands of years. However, seem, it seems to me that the political, social, emotional aspects of language have only been a topic of research for something like the last three centuries. So now, okay, let's let's take this. So three centuries also is a lot of time, you know. And uh, but when we see, so yeah, for three hundred years, uh, it, uh, a scholarly interest uh, has become a little more common. It's spreading. People are taking interest in language. But the common man, right? Like for someone like my father, right? Or someone like uh, my brother, my mother, you know, some of my friends, just regular people going about their day. Mm -hmm. How have you? Uh, had the chance to, I'm sure you, you've been doing this for 30 years, that uh, have you seen, would you be able to construct a, uh, an understanding for me on how they see language? How serious they are about language? I'll give you one example, uh, Professor Green. Like uh, when we were growing up and whenever say there was a confrontation to take place in the family, my father would mm -hmm. use one word called delicate. Delicate. It's a delicate situation. Now he's a common man, right? Uh, he worked for the government and uh, he had a small job. And he's, this is, he was very clear. It's a delicate situation. Now I was young and he did not explain it further. Right. right? I don't know if he expected us to understand it or he was probably telling it to himself. I don't know. But I took the situation to be delicate because we are confronting people about something that, you know, you don't really know how to navigate that space. But I think he also meant if you're going to con uh, confront them, be, be careful about your choice of word because you don't want to disintegrate the relationship. So, so he had some sense as a common man, but generally, how do you see it? Like among regular people, are, how, do, how do they see language? How do they think of language, if at all? Right. I have, I'm a little bit hesitant to make sweeping generalizations about what mm. common people, the common man, as you would say, think about these things. But to make a couple of you know, very weak, suggestive kind of hypotheses, conjectures, it might be something like this. I think many of us probably have two different streams of thought about language that aren't quite the same and might actually be in a little bit of tension with each other, but they might, might both be part of common sense anyway. One is language is a tool for conveying your thoughts. And I think most people, if you were to just go around with a clipboard and ask people to answer your questions on the street, would you say, if you ask them, is language a tool for conveying your thoughts? Most people would say, yes, of course. So then that's probably part of common sense. But I also think, and this is, I think, come to be, to be the case more and more in the last maybe 10 or 15 years, people are more self-conscious of the ways in which language can be used to harm mm -hmm. and to marginalize and to treat people in unfair ways and unjust ways and so forth. So think about the ways in which people are sensitive now to the pronouns that are used. 
mm. to discuss people who have made various choices about how they want to live their lives. And people take pronoun use as an important way of indicating where they stand on things. And whereas in my experience, at least 25 years ago, the majority of everyday folks might not have taken that seriously as something mm. that they need to spend time worrying about. It seems mm. to be now that's more part of our consciousness is something that matters. Likewise, there's been a lot of scholarly interest as well as public interest in the use of various kinds of charged language, including pejoratives and slurs. And like nowadays, unlike what was the case when I was a kid growing up in the 60s and 70s, people are more conscious of the ways in which those types of words can be used to harm in which they can be used to make people victims and so forth. So, so it seems to me, and that is kind of, even though it might have started out as more of a scholarly kind of highbrow kind of study, I think it has become more widespread as something people, high school kids and, and uh, nurses and, and lawyers and teachers and so forth are conscious of as ways in which they want to be careful about not just what they say, but how they say it. So it seems to me in the last maybe quarter century, people, at least in the cultures to which I've had, had exposure, have become more self-conscious about the ways in which they speak in order to be more respectful of others. And I think that's a good thing. If I, you know, if you read a novel from the 1920s, for example, you're probably, if it, if it has, if it's about everyday folks as opposed to aristocratic people or something, even then you might find it this way. But if you were to read a novel from 100 years ago, you probably would find people describing people of different ethnicities and nationalities and various with various slurs and various prejudices and various stereotypes and so forth. The Italians are like this and the Greeks are like that and the Irish are like this and so forth. It seems constant in many areas of literature from about hundred years ago and before, whereas that sort of thing was considered much less acceptable now. So, so that's a, yeah. I just want to just finish that thought before I forget. That's the a way in which on the one hand, I think many of us in a matter of common sense say languages for conveying your thoughts, but I also think many of us common sensically would say, but we should be careful how we convey those thoughts yeah. because sometimes words, sometimes words can hurt. And that seems to me to be a, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of progress, I think, in, in popular culture is I think people are coming to realize that yes, indeed, what words you use can, can, be, hurt, can be hurtful and we should be more self-conscious about those things. Here is what I'm sensing from what you're saying, uh, Professor Green. So it mm -hmm. seems to me that we're evolving, right? As a species, so now, there are certain things that we can stand up to and oppose, which about a hundred years back was taken to be the way things are, but now we're standing yeah. up to them and opposing. But perhaps what's taking time is for language to catch up with the change. Do you think that we can sense something, we can feel something, uh, we can feel it in our hearts. And of course uh, that we are always open to exploitation because we are unable to articulate ourselves to ourselves. But that is because perhaps th there has to be a, uh, an evolution in the language itself to catch up with the evolution that is happening in our culture. Do you think we, in some sense, lack the language we need to be able to find us our, our feet uh, in this in this constantly and fast changing environment? For my father, he has lived about uh, seventy years. You know, a lot of people who've been around for a long time. It's very difficult for them to change. But even people half his age, people my age, you know, in their thirties and their forties, uh, they are confronted with the change, which is which is which is not always easy because today this changes, tomorrow that changes, day after that changes, and you find yourself at a loss of how to psychologically uh, understand the change. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the world being a global village now, it's a huge global village. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's huge, right? So, so many changes are happening and we don't often find ourselves equipped to, uh, uh, to have the language, to have the words. Uh, so do you think that uh, the, an evolution or a revolution or some change in language is needed to catch up with this change, which seems to be just going like fast and mm -hmm. in whatever direction it is going? Sure. I would also say, I do think that language needs to catch up with changes in our thought patterns, but I'd also say the converse is probably also true. There are probably also cases in which our thought patterns need to catch up with language. That is to say, language is one of many cultural institutions. And sometimes it becomes sophisticated and subtle in ways that not everybody actually fully appreciates. They need to get their cognitive and affective, that is emotional uh, selves, on, on board, as it were, up to speed with the language that's changing. So it seems to me, I would not prioritize thought over language or language over thought. They sort of tend to go in unison. In individual cases, you have certain people that, that are more ahead in one than the other and so forth. But I don't think, I wouldn't, I, I think it, 
wouldn't be quite accurate to say, first, there's sophistication at the cognitive or emotional level, and then language catches up. They all just jump and move forward in various complicated and messy and hard to understand ways. But I would say for sure, so as, as individuals get older, they're generally speaking, and on the whole, there are of course plenty of exceptions, but generally speaking, and on the whole, less supple in their ability to change in response to developments in language or anywhere else. And so we often look at one of the reasons I like teaching students that are 28, 20 years old or so is that they're much more flexible in their thinking and, and, their, and their affective responses to various things. They're much more willing to embrace linguistic innovations, whereas people that are my age or older tend to be a little bit less willing to do so. They might kind of find them amusing, but they won't take them seriously. And that's part of how language changes. When you have new users that are more plastic in their mentality, as it were, more able to, to accommodate changes, they tend to accept them. And I should also notice also that, as with every, with every new generation, new generations tend to sort of mark their own identity. Gen X, Gen Y, millennials, et cetera, tend to mark their own identity in certain linguistic ways. So there are phrases that my 20 year old students use that I sometimes am mystified by. And it's not just that they're their own phrases, um, they're more like they're kind of markers of their own distinctiveness. Yeah. And so part of what each generation does to, to identify itself as distinctive and unique is to have its own jargon, its own lingo. And that whole process is part of what makes language exciting because you've always got new surprising things that are happening, new ways of speaking. So for example, my 20 or 25 year old students seem to be using pronouns less and less in the following context. For example, I'll get an email from a student saying, um, hope you're doing well. There's, an, there's no I beginning of the sentence. There's just hope you're doing well. Whereas, whereas it would never occur to me to drop, to drop the pronoun there unless I was in a big hurry or something like that. But it's totally natural for a 20 or 25 year old to drop the pronoun at the beginning of the sentence. And they're not losing any information value. It's clear who they're talking about. They're talking about themselves. Who else would be saying it? So it's an innovation in the sense that it makes language more, more, more efficient. I'd also say, you know, given the pervasiveness of texting and social media platforms, there's a lot of premium on being able to say a lot with very few words or even very few letters. And so our language, I think, is probably going to reflect that change in the coming years with more and more words, phrases that were once acronyms becoming actual words, like FOMO, yeah. might just be a way of saying fear of missing out. So it's not an acronym, it actually just means fear of missing out. There's no reason that couldn't happen. And so, and so it's always fun for me, kind of exciting, because it's kind of what I, what I, you know, spend a lot of time thinking about the ways in which the whole process of being a new generation, defining your own identity, connecting that with specific markers, including certain words that are distinctively your own generations, how that drives linguistic change. Right. And it's always done so. So far as I know, it's done so for thousands of years. And that's part of what makes language such a fun thing to study is that it's always refreshing itself. I understand it. I don't, I understand this. It's uh, some thoughts that, that sh taking shape in my mind. Then let's see how, I, how well I can, you know, uh, unfold it through my speech. So before we uh, start embarked on this journey with language, uh, Tatwadi for the first two months focused on mathematics. Both me and my husband, we've met a lot of uh, six, seven mathematics and we don't have a math ma mathematical background. So we connected on uh, the common ground of ideas. Okay, so one thing I learned about, about uh, mathematics is it's based on axioms. There are certain axioms, so you okay, there's always something to fall back on. You know, right. you're going ahead. You can start afresh, and here are these four axioms, five axioms, and apparently there's talk of being uh, some some new ones being introduced. But uh, mm -hmm. it'll be generally agreed upon uh, within uh, the community and all mathematicians. You know. So now in language, what it was coming to my mind is this one line from Mr. Chomsky, who said every sentence that we ever say is an experiment in itself. So now if we are true to that spirit of experiment and uh, if that is like an axiom for language. So I'm not saying I'm setting out to hurt you, be mean to you or, you know, take out my rage, which belongs to uh, X, but I'm taking it out on you because I can, but I'm here. Like you have to be really honest to yourself. It's a very delicate thing, right? But do you think there are these axioms that we can have or we already have in language that if the common man knew, there's much to benefit from? Is there something like this to fall back on? I see. That's an interesting question. That one that I thought about very much before. I would tend to be skeptical of the idea that there are any axioms 
as governed language. There are generalizations that are pretty good as working hypotheses or rules of thumb. Mm -hmm. um, another famous line of Chomsky's is that virtually every sentence that has ever been uttered in the history of the world is a sentence that has not been uttered before. Yeah, 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 yes. Now, that's pretty good. It's not an axiom, though. You could have a language in which people are repetitive. They might still use language for certain you know, phrases, purposes. Yeah. Phrase. Exactly. That's right. Stock phrases and so forth, or people who are just not very imaginative. That wouldn't make it so that they're no longer using a language. They're just kind of boring, perhaps, but they would still be able to use language for communication. So I wouldn't lay that down as an axiom, if only because I can easily imagine a linguistic community in which people were using the same sentences over and over again. So I'm not so moved by that. Um, if it if it were if we were to get anything close to an, something like an axiom about language, it would be those ideas that I had before. That is, this is partly definitional too. That language is this recursive and and compositional system of syntax and semantics. That's technical, so it's not very interesting um, for for someone who doesn't have the background. But mm -hmm. those are things that are roughly speaking axiomatic. I think beyond that. Generally speaking, my experience is that when somebody tries to lay down an axiom for language, someone else comes along and says, no, nope, that doesn't apply to this particular linguistic group that we just discovered in the Amazon. Or no, that doesn't apply to this particular linguistic group that, that lives in the plateau of Tibet or something like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm generally, I generally like to be pretty conservative about laying down axioms if only because language is a living, growing, evolving thing, whereas mathematics tends to be, at least ideally, something that once we discover is there and fixed. Right. We know certain things, and that's and those things that we know in mathematics are, in an important sense, necessarily true. Whereas the things we know about language are true as they apply to certain linguistic groups at certain times, but coming up with so-called linguistic universals is an interesting project and a challenging project, a really challenging project, hard to do. And so I'd be skittish about getting anything, making anything too strong. Again, strong, interesting generalization that bears pretty, that is pretty well supported is that among linguistic groups, every, let me try it again, that here's another one that you might consider pretty attractive. Every human group that has been existing on this earth has had a language. Individuals might fail to get a language because they, they might have not been exposed and they might not be neurotypical, but it does seem like a pretty good generalization that human beings are language using creatures, almost as in a way that's due to their nature as human beings. And so Chomsky and those who follow him would say, most definitely that language is a genetic phenomenon as much as a cultural phenomenon that we're born with some part of our genetic makeup with the capacity to become language users. And there's some pretty strong evidence in favor of that theory. It's not beyond, beyond the possibility of being challenged, but it's got a great deal going for it and has explained a lot of things over the last several decades. So if, if someone else were, were reaching for axioms, they might pull out things of that sort. Mm -hmm. But in general, I would say um, I tend to be pretty conservative about, about axioms in this area as, as opposed to trying to find reasonably broad generalizations and then to see how far they can be stretched to explain phenomena. But I generally, in my experience, have found when you try to make your generalization into an axiomatic, exception-free, <laughs> for all possible languages kind of claim, you tend to, be, tend, tend to find counterexamples. Okay, point taken. Um, so for our... Um... Second episode, uh, we had a philosopher of mathematics uh, on Dr. Mark Balaga. And uh, he's, a, he's a, like you're a philosopher of language, he's a philosopher of math. So one of the things I asked him was, what does a philosopher of math who's not actively doing mathematics, what does he, he or she bring to the table of math? And his response is very interesting. He says, uh, uh, well, not much. But he had much more to say. He also said that uh, if the table is only math, then not much. But if the table is all of reality, and since math is the language of nature, then the philosopher of math is somewhere uh, trying to understand the nature of reality. And also sometimes they help when a math mathematician who's, because a mathematician is not a philosopher, when they perhaps, he gave an example of some the set theory or something where uh, he said that the mathematician was walking down a certain road and uh, then it was a philosopher who stepped in and said, this is the wrong road to walk, walk down. It was proven that the philosopher was right. So <laughs> is there, uh, what do you think as a philosopher of language Language. What is it that you're bringing uh, to the table of language? Sure. I think of myself as, in large part, 
doing two things. And when I say what I'm doing, it's what I'm doing in conjunction with thousands of other scholars around the world who yeah. have similar interests, not something that I'm doing uniquely, of course. And those two things are one, trying to develop and refine a fairly clear and articulate set of concepts and related vocabularies for talking about how, how we use language. And that would be something that's accessible, not just to researchers, but also to everyday folks. So for example, yeah. I've got a textbook in the philosophy of language that I published recently. It's brief and I tried, tried to make it fairly user friendly. And I'm hoping that someone who's just curious, um, who doesn't necessarily have a st strong background in the area or isn't necessarily even a college level student could read it and get some benefit from it because they could hopefully see it as a way of shedding light on the complex mass that is language use. And they could hopefully with concepts that I provide make be able to make some useful distinctions. This is part of what you said or this is part of what you meant, but not part of what you said, or this word that you use can be emotionally damaging, and here's why, or you said this, and that implies this other thing. Did you mean to apply that other thing? If not, why? What, if so, are you, are you aware of that implication? So developing a more articulate and more sophisticated understanding of language gives us better understanding of the tool that we already have, and enables us, I think, to use that tool in a more powerful, effective, socially equitable, perhaps even just way. So that's part of what I think I can bring to the table, namely giving everybody hmm. the ability to, as it were, it's a part of the process of self-understanding. Hmm. It's a part of the process of self-knowledge. That is, we spend a whole lot of our time, as I said, in inner speech as well as in conversation, a whole lot of our time with language and getting a better understanding of what's happening when we're doing that seems to be an important, important process as part of understanding who we are. So that's one. And then another one is, the more cognitive science aspect of what I do, in which it's in conjunction with people in not just philosophy, but also linguistics, psychology, maybe even neuroscience in some cases, and also given my interest in the evolutionary biology of communication, locking arms with other, other researchers to try to get a better scientific understanding of this phenomena, this phenomenon that's a huge part of the life of our own species. And so that includes things like trying to understand, and, and I should say, as a philosopher, I don't do experiments so much, I don't do empirical research, but I try to make comments on the research of others when they are out in the field and come back with, with results. I also try to give concepts to people that can hopefully be use, useful in an, in an empirical way. And so when I do that, that's a part of a larger enterprise of trying to understand this complex phenomenon that's of scientific interest, namely human language, mm -hmm. and maybe communication systems more generally. Human language probably most likely evolved out of communication systems that were more primitive, and many of us are interested in how that process would have gone. So when I do my theorizing, my scholarly work about the concept of meaning, I try, for example, to think about how primitive forms of meaning might have appeared on the planet before we had anything as sophisticated as, as what we know in human natural languages. Are there forms of meaning that are in some ways more primitive than what we find with verb phrases and noun phrases and conditionals and, and and ors and so forth? The hope is that we can discover some, some such things in order, in order to understand how this amazing phenomenon known as language actually evolved. Some Good. scientists would say the hardest open question in science right now, this might be an overstatement, but one dramatic way of putting it would be that the hardest open question in science right now is the evolution of language. We've right. got a long way to go to understand how that happened. And so I consider myself to be a very small player in a larger conversation about that, that's aimed to trying to solve that, that mystery. And I understand so in that what... respect, then, yeah. It's a contribution to common sense and our self-understanding and hopefully also a contribution to science. Yeah, I have a couple of questions here, but I think I'll, I'll make one point too, that uh, uh, I had never thought of it this way, but it, it made total sense once I heard it, that since there are no fossilized mm -hmm. words, definitely that really poses a big challenge for uh, people to study uh, how language evolved at what point sure. but one thing if you see uh, professor green it's like if we take away the the jargons today we know there is something called a verb something called a noun something called a this something called a that okay fine mm -hmm. but when these things were in the process of development they seemed to have fallen into a natural order a natural order of speech then which perhaps got repeated uh, the pattern got set it made sense if you if you said don't go there uh, or something a little more complex than that something that needed you more than, needed more than your body language to be conveyed and the other person understood right. that pattern said right. that per pattern got repeated that pattern worked so mm -hmm. now what one of the things i have, i really want to understand is like uh, 
you know, uh, I've been studying a little bit about pidgin and Creole languages. So the mm -hmm. pidgin languages when people of, for the lack of uh, not having the technical knowledge here, but people of totally different cultures who don't speak uh, the same language kind of thrown in together. And now they have to right. find a way to converse. And mostly the language right. they end up developing is something that lacks grammar. Now the same mm -hmm. people with the next generation, the children, mm -hmm. they seem to be uh, inserting grammar into it, which then becomes That's real, right? right? So right. now what right. does this tell us about the nature of language that there is, what does this tell us? Like there is a language is happening and we tend to kind of as humans, uh, like it's somewhere in the air, it has its rules, it has its patterns and uh, we're like mouthpieces for language. We're like, I see. <laughs> what I was suggesting earlier on this idea that there is a strong bit of evidence for the idea that language is genetically driven, at least in part, that process from pigeons to creoles, creolization as it's called, is often pointed to as one important bit of evidence for the genetic basis of language. Yeah. That is to say, instead of language being in the air, mm. people who follow the scholars like Chomsky would say, it's in the genes. How and do we enter the genes? That are, How that, that's, that's why that, and they would say that's why children that are born into yeah. this situation that you described, the children of parents that, sp that spoke the pigeon, they would have a very strong motivation to add some grammatical structure to the communicative system that they already that, that they were that they were born into. And so there would be a the claim is that there's a genetic basis to that process of creolization. So this genetic basis, do you think it has some axioms if you study? Some axioms. Mm. Only those axioms that apply to genetics as a science. What would that and there be? There are axioms that apply to genetics as a science, you know, heritability of various kinds of genes. So, for example, you know, an, uh, I guess I call it an axiom that evolutionary theory um, would say there's no um acquisition of acquired characteristics that is to say genetic modification doesn't happen just because somebody learns something in the course of their lifetime mm -hmm. so pre-darwinian theorizing about evolution corresponding to the work of people like lamarck lamarck's story would have been oh why do giraffes have long necks oh because the mother or father stretched their necks really far in order to get leaves high up in the trees and they and as their necks their necks get longer in the course of their lives and they pass that that they, they pass that longer neck down to the children, to which modern day geneticists would say, no, it doesn't happen like that. You don't acquire, you don't, you don't inherit acquired characteristics. The only ways in which you get characteristics are ones that are already genetically determined, and those were already in your parents. So there's not the only genetic change is when you've got the mixture of genetic material between father and mother. So that's something like an axiom of genetics, but not about linguistics specifically. So there are lots of things that a geneticist was, was going to say to you about how, how genes work, how they do their job. Those are, I suppose you could put them in axiomatic terms. I would rather myself not so much talk about axioms as very strong laws that govern the science principles. of genetics because mm -hmm. principles, that's right, much better. I think principles is a better, better word there mm -hmm. than, than axiom is. Um, and those are pretty strong, pretty robust, but there are phenomena that seem a little bit like the Lamarckian, Lamarckian effects, the biologists study. So I'd be, again, skittish about making strong claims that are too strong. However, um, uh, there are powerful scientific te techniques for understanding genetic processes, genetic factors. And those linguists that work in that area would say, yes, we can tell you a lot about how there seem to be genes that determine how language is, is learned. So wow. that's some pretty powerful stuff. Yeah. And would help explain, would help explain the process of creolization. I guess so. I guess so. Then, okay, uh, going back a little to uh, what you were saying earlier about the work that you're doing as a philosopher of language uh, and this uh, th uh, this uh, little thing that you're trying to create, which can help people, even the common man and woman, understand, uh, you know, the implications of the language that they use, no, ma no matter what language. I'm sure it'll have its limitations too, but still, mm -hmm. there is maybe some kind of a light uh, it's, it's throwing on how people use language. What would mm -hmm. you say? How would you define your, your if in a sentence, if you can define your, you explained it, but if in a sentence, what's your goal with it? What is it that you intend to accomplish with this kind of work? With this kind of work, my goal is 
making a contribution to our understanding of ourselves. That is increasing our, our, our knowledge of ourselves, it's the self-knowledge project. So uh, you are obviously familiar with the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, mm -hmm. right? This is another thing mm -hmm. I picked up from the same film and it was so mm -hmm. interesting. And on the face of it, it seems, it seems to make sense to someone like me. Yeah, it, I think so that uh, my thoughts are shaped by language. Now, I don't go, I think a regular person would just take it on face value and, and, and run with it, you know, you, you're not really probing into the idea of what is it, what is it saying. But do you think after having this conversation with me for a little while now, where we were also talking about how it's uh, sometimes language has to catch up with thought, sometimes thought has to catch up with language, as we were discussing earlier, what do you think, do you think language influences the way we think? I do think language influences the way we think, although I also believe that the saber Wharf hypothesis, at least as it's been popularly understood, has also been overblown. The amusing article um, by, I believe, Jeff Numberg was the author, um, called The Great Eskimo Vocabulary Hoax, in which he started out with the often cited claim that Inuit people who live in, up in Canada and so forth, indigenous people have, well, the original claim was something like have 11 different words for snow. Mm. And then 10 years later, someone else picked it up and they made that into 20 different words for snow. And then by the 1970s, you could see newspaper, a TV and newspaper articles saying things like, you know, these people have hundreds of words for snow. It just came out of nowhere. And so popular culture has taken some version of the Saber Wharf hypothesis and bent it out of recognition and made it so that it's something that's completely implausible. If we were to sit down and try to figure out, and by means of a careful experiment with randomized controlled trial, according to our best experimental techniques, what would we find in determining whether and in what way language affects thought? The answer is, as I understand it, there is some evidence for that, but it's much less dramatic than you might have expected. Mm -hmm. So there are different, uh, cult, different ling linguistic groups that have different ways of counting objects. Some have number terms, others just have more or less, a lot, a few. And there are some psychological experiments that make a pretty good case that those linguistic groups that don't have number terms that just have more like a lot and a few, people who live in the latter cultures tend to be less specific and precise in their determination of, the, of quantities when they're asked how many things there are, for example. So mm -hmm. there is some evidence for the saber wharf, but, but, but the common understanding is certainly the understanding that often my students will come to the table of the way in which language affects thought um, tends to make it a much more dramatic effect than, it's, than current research suggests that it is. It, ha it does happen to some extent, but we need to be careful about not taking, not, not believing in a sort of cartoon version of the safer work hypothesis. Okay, right. But I just want to be careful. Yeah, and uh, so you have been a, a philosopher of language for 30 years. That's, that's a lot of time that you've invested in this thing. What would you say it has told you about who we are? language, through language, what is it that you've understood about human beings? And what would you say has this study contributed to your understanding of what the world is like? A couple of things. I'd say one thing that language gives us is incredible powers of planning, calculation, decision making, and subtle communication that, so far as I know, is not matched by any non-human animal species. I want to be careful there when I say so far as I know, because there's a lot, I think, that we have yet to learn about communication among, for example, dolphins. Maybe we'll find in the next 15 years that dolphins, when they communicate, have a linguistic, has a, have a communicated system, maybe even a linguistic system that's more sophisticated than ours. I don't see any reason in principle why that couldn't happen. We just don't know enough about how dolphins mm. communicate to be able to make any broad claims. So I'd be very conservative about claims that we make now. Um, and I often find that linguists and philosophers and others tend to make broad sweeping claims about how we are the unique species that has language. And I would say, we just don't know enough. You might be surprised. And if you look back at the history of science, there's been a lot of scientific developments that no one could have predicted beforehand. So I'd just yeah. be careful there. So that's one kind of qualification I'd want to add. But with that qualification, made, I would say, so far as we know, we have the ability to, to plan together using language, for example. You know, for example, think about the ways in which I might write out a plan in which if I do X, you do Y. And if I do Z, you do W. 
And if I do if I do Q, then you do you do L or something like that. A complex, subtle, nuanced plan that, so far as we know, no other species has the capacity to do. I believe that that power, that technology, essentially, has been part of what makes our species such an unbelievably dominant species on this planet. But notice that as come, is coming to be. Uh, well known nowadays, unlike what, what might have been the case 50 years ago, it's coming to be well known nowadays that our, our astonishing dominance on this planet is not an entirely good thing. That is to say, we're doing a great deal of damage to our planet, partly, perhaps partly because we have such unfettered control over what happens in many areas of it. So it seems to me the technology that language has brought with it has been a double-edged sword in many ways. In some ways, it has made life, our lives better. In some ways, it has made our existence, our very existence, very precarious. If we didn't have language, I suspect we'd be much less sophisticated, much less dominant as a species. Yeah. And the Earth, in some important ways, would probably be better off as a result of that. So, yeah. so, so I don't want to go around trumpeting the wonders of language and say that it's an unmitigated good thing, because I think it also has been, enabled us to do a great deal of damage to the planet as well as to one another. So that's one thing. Another aspect of it is that language enables us, as I've said, to harm one another in ways that are subtle and more subtle than physical harm, but sometimes perhaps more powerful than pervasive because linguistic harms can do psychological damage in ways that can be far reaching. So the ways in which, for example, we frame one another in the ways in which we're, with phrases, metaphor, slurs, idioms, and so forth can, can sometimes do as much damage as good. And I think that the process of self-knowledge that we get in understanding language can at least has the hope of helping us to be more careful and mindful of those sorts of activities that we engage in. So those are some of the things that I think that by way of sort of big picture potential payoffs of understanding of understanding language. But I by no means want to sort of unfurl the flag and wave it and say, you know, Ta-da, look at us, we're so wonderful because we have this powerful tool called language. It is a powerful tool, but that doesn't mean it's always being used. Like you, said, like you said, like you said, double-edged sword. Yes, and I. Uh, so uh, sometimes um, my husband, it's much more often in the last few years, we have been teaching um, a lot of these uh, children from around the village where we are in. So these are mm -hmm. children of parents who are like parents. They're uneducated parents and they're illiterate themselves, and so they sometimes come home and we they want to learn English obviously okay. right they're all interested in english so okay. while teaching them the language and it is it was such a phenomenal experience for both of us i think at some point i started to see language as doing two things now this was only teaching english uh, because that's what they were interested in and a bit of hindi because i speak hindi so okay. i've realized that there the language seems to have uh, this is my own experience seems to have two things that it is doing like for for for, for example uh, there are ideas that you can convey through language and then there are something simpler uh, uh let's say for the lack of a better word it is not it is maybe shallow compared to the depth that an idea might have it's an instruction it's important it's useful but it might lack the depth that an idea might have and so to know that language contains within itself instructions and also mm -hmm. like uh, ideas, I don't know, like somebody can say an instruction is an idea too. But what I mean is like, if I tell someone go and sit there, go and sit, it's very much an instruction. And I have mm -hmm. a reason behind it to ask them to do that. And then there is an idea where, uh, let's say, where we discuss, yeah, how is language really influencing? When you respond to me, like this young girl I was talking to, I asked her, when you say this, that you don't know, and you say it back, What's going mm -hmm. on in your head? You know, so something mm -hmm. uh, provokes a thought and something does not always provoke a thought. So there seems to be like, do you think this kind of an understanding of language that uh, the, the, the skeleton, the framework of language, there are these two, let's say, blood streams in it. One is quite instructional. One is ideation. And because all the things like you were saying that the destruction or the, or the cre beautiful things that we create, because we have this gift of language or, you know, in some sense, the non gift or the curse of language, as we sometimes turn it into, because we don't understand that these are ideas, and we get gripped by them, confusing them to be instructions. Uh, am I making sense here? Um, I think I understand you. So it's certainly clear that one of the hazards of teaching, especially young children, is that they don't always distinguish between just sheer ideas on the one hand 
and suggestions, plans, commands, directives, or, or instructions as to what they ought to do. And so that can often result in misunderstanding and, there, and thereby you know, mis, misbehavior, I suppose. And that's not unique to children by any means. We often sort of say, I'm just considering this idea. I want you to think about this idea. Just, just reflect on it for a moment, see its implications. And often people will respond, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> and my response will be, I'm not asking you to do it. I just want you to think about that plan to see what, what, what would it flow. So it's a relatively sophisticated process to be able to separate the idea from the plan to put an idea into action. Not everybody can do that. It's not always a natural thing for people to do, understandably, because so much language use is put for practical purposes for most people's lives. But, but, but with some effort, I think we can draw that distinction and get those two streams, as it were, relatively separate from, from, from one another for certain pedagogical purposes, mm -hmm. as well as for understanding ourselves. And it's important to be able to say, suppose that so-and-so where I'm just asking you to consider an idea, reflect on it, draw out its implications without for a minute asking you to act on that idea. And that's an important part of philosophy, an important part of reasoning and planning and so forth. But it takes some effort and some patience and some skill and some meeting halfway on the part of their listener to, to, to try to do that with you. Because often people's response is going to be, but I don't want to do that. And the answer, again, the answer is, that's, I'm not asking you to do it. I'm asking you to just think about it. Mm -hmm. It just takes practice. I don't think it's an insurmountable problem, but it's something that requires just uh, patience and, and uh, lots it's of a, to... it's a it's not an easy habit to break it's really right. not an easy to and and to think requires effort and i think sure. we need to realize it like uh, that it's it's not easy to think just because we're able to go yeah. about a day doing everyday mm -hmm. chores we take it for granted that we can think but when we find ourselves uh, really you know between a rock and a hard place we find ourselves lacking and you know i've seen how much it's like you have to keep that knife sharp the knife right. of language has to be kept. That's right. That's right. right. One of my teachers once said that reasoning is like walking. We all, most of us, know how to walk, but we don't. We often don't walk in a way that shows any kind of reflection on the way we walk and trying to use poise and do it in a way that's balanced and good for our posture and so forth. And if we start trying to walk better, it takes an effort, often a fair bit of time, to improve our walking quality. But with time, if we do it, we stick with it, we can actually do it better. It might be better for our backs and our posture and so forth. It's like that with reasoning as well. We all can reason to some extent, but it's only when we reflect on the way in which we reason and the various kinds of fallacies, confusions, ambiguities, and pitfalls reasoning can fall into that we're going to have a chance of improving our reasoning processes. Yeah. And that's a long-term painstaking activity that I um, make my students work through very hard every semester. Hopefully they benefit from it, but it's not something that comes naturally to most of us. No, it most doesn't. Of us, you know, reason in a way that that is second nature but i believe that for most most people if they were to reflect on the reasoning that they engage in and of course most of that reasoning is inflected by language if they were to re reflect on it they probably would be able to reason more effectively and more powerfully since we uh, end up for um, uh, end up uh, for the lack of a better word falling for certain narratives that do the rounds there are narratives, there are stories that we end up believing in, there are ideas that we end up believing in, right? I have personally noticed one of the things that is the, uh, kind of uh, doing the rounds these days is that if you want to be objective, now I, uh, it is very possible that I'm using the wrong words, but I hope that you will be able to extract the meaning from my, uh, what I'm trying to say. A bit to be, let's say, objective, as objective as you can be. Somewhere I feel people are, um, yeah, generalization, but I don't have anything better right now. So people are somewhere being told or are finding this way themselves to kind of pull away from their emotions, like cut themselves off from their emotions because they feel that uh, the emotions, no matter what those emotions are, they're going to come in the way of them being objective in their speech, in their thought. So, but, 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 I personally feel there's a lot that one misses out on uh, if we don't, if we, if we try to cut ourselves out uh, uh, from our emotions. Do you see anything like this happening that in, I can only be cold and straight to the point and that's how I can speak my mind? Instead of saying perhaps uh, learning 
what the emotions are that are driving you in a certain way. And then, uh, like you said, subtle is one word you, you used a lot, like a sophisticated way to deal with our thoughts, a sophisticated way to deal with our emotions. Do you think uh, emotions are a part of uh, language, like a, 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 a emotional education is a part, the, the, the emotional uh, intelligence is the, the fairly famous term, but okay. emotion, uh, huh. Yeah. The question is lots of parts. I'll try to address some of them. Okay. It actually is not not my experience that people, at least the ones that I interact with, either on university campuses or in life around where I tend to visit when I travel or see family members and so forth, I don't have a great deal of experience people saying we should be more objective. Okay. Um, it seems to me, if anything, Americans, for example, that I come across think that, I mean, often people tend to look askance at the idea of objectivity. It seems to me there's a popular culture skepticism of objectivity. People often say, no, so there's no such thing as objectivity. Everything is subjective. Everything is from a point of view. Everything is, all knowledge is, is inflected by interests and so forth. Now, I'm not sure that that's true, but it seems to me, my experience is that in popular culture, there tends to be, this is again, just my experience. There tends to be an offhand, almost automatic, reflexive rejection of the idea of objectivity as somehow either unachievable or if it were achievable, it would be a bad thing to try to achieve anyway. So we shouldn't bother with it. So, but it seems to me many people say that, but I'm not sure how many people actually believe it. Just as many people say that the, the, the truth or ethics, for example, is relative to your point of view, but I'm not sure actually how many people actually in fact believe that. So there's what people say, and then there's how people actually act when the going gets rough, when, when choices have to be made. And those two often will come apart. More interestingly, though, for me, though, is the question, to what extent emotions are in tension with knowledge, objectivity, and so forth. And it seems to me there's no reason why they have to be. It depends on what the emotions are, what the situation is. Again, if you, I've already probably established my MO as one who's uh, generally scared of, of big generalizations. So I try to stay away from it. But, you know, think about the idea of being passionate. Being passionate about a subject is an emotion, but being passionate about a subject might be a very, very powerful way of helping you become expert at it. If you're passionate about the history of, you know, a certain sport or something like that, that'll probably help you to become very expert at it as opposed to somehow blinding you to the facts or something. So uh, the emotion of passion, excitement, interest, even love can make something open to you and make you pursue it in great depth in a way that, in a way that others might be more lackadaisical, in which case there's no, there need to be no conflict with, with uh, emotions and knowledge and emotions and objectivity. On the other hand, there are certain cases in which, for example, those emotions such as bias if you feel a fear or a hatred of people of a certain group, you might you might accordingly have have an unwillingness to understand what happens with them that can connect up with the well established phenomenon of, of uh, confirmation bias, for example, In confirmation bias people will often when something happens like a crime, for instance, they'll often just remember, you know, when that crime is committed by people of a certain target group. And forget about all those cases in which that type of crime, same type of crime, is committed by people of a different group. And they just focus on, they just emphasize that target group, those target group members and the way in which they've committed that crime. And then the next thing you know, we'll often find them saying, all exes do that, or the only people who do that kind of crime are exes and so forth. And that's prejudice. And so there's an example in which an emotion could very well be contrary to, to having an objective understanding of what happens around us. So it seems to me it depends on the emotion. Some emotions are deleterious. Can be harmful in the way of knowledge. Other, other other emotions can propel us towards knowledge and make us better at understanding things and better at communicating our thoughts and so forth. So I think it just depends on the emotion. But I would say in general that um, for anybody who does want to learn about things, who does want to try to get a better understanding of things, they should they should do a gut check, as it were, take a look at the way in which their emotions are, might be affecting them, and ask themselves whether those emotions might might have an effect that could skew otherwise distort understanding of the, of the issues in question. So for example, if somebody has a, an axe on the, an axe to ground, um, a beef as, as we say mm -hmm. in American English about a certain topic, they might be biased in their understanding of what, what that phenomenon is. Mm -hmm. right? So I, again, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to make a gross generalization, but it seems to me sometimes emotions are helpful. Sometimes they can stand in the way of, our, of, of uh, increasing our understanding.
in general, I would say, and I try to do this is when I try to research anything on my own, in general, I would say it's probably best to at least be aware of what emotions are occurring inside of you at a given time if you're able to, and ask yourself whether they might be helping or harming your, your, your understanding of whatever topic you care about. Right, right, right. And uh, uh, another thing I've uh, seen uh, commonly is that people often fail to find the right words. And this, I just had a very, I've experienced this in my life, fail to find the right words. Oh, often I, I failed to find the right word that didn't have the mm -hmm. right words right mm -hmm. um so recently i mean this is something a phenomena uh, i've participated in i've uh, sometimes there have been times when i haven't been able to find the right words continues to mm -hmm. happen to this day but much less and i've observed mm -hmm. people uh you know with struggle with finding the right words for yeah. instance so we yeah. live in south india and um uh, we get uh, coconut water delivered to our place. Oh. You know, yeah, a good thing to have in summers. Mm -hmm. So the guy who comes to deliver, and he's a very nice, sweet guy, right? And so he came this time, and we make uh, 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 we make payments through our phone. Okay, yeah. he gets it on his phone. I make it through my phone, and uh, sure. usually I'll uh, send a screenshot that I've made the payment, it is done. So maybe the last time um, uh, my husband was involved and, uh, you know, and he forgot to send the screenshot. Yeah. So he comes mm -hmm. and he says very like uncomfortably. Mm -hmm. Something I know that the conversations around money usually end up, you know, people get very uncomfortable. I'd like to understand why, but here is what happened right. with him. So he said, did you uh, last time? That's it. That's all he had to say. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We mm -hmm. definitely uh, paid. And uh, then my husband came out and said, no, no, no. Uh, the whole payment is uh, taken care of. He's like, okay. So he's not convinced, but he's not saying it. He's implying it. Yeah, and then right. the, uh, my husband said, okay, uh, we'll, we'll check the history and we'll let you know. And he immediately said, no, 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 no. Don't check the history of your payments. Fine, fine, fine. It's okay. And he mm -hmm. just got onto his scooter and he left. So right, somewhere, so we know this, that if you ask someone to confirm on their end, if they have made mm -hmm. the payment, there is something impolite happening. Nobody right, knows what right. it is, but right. we take it upon ourselves to feel bad about it. If I ask you to give me mm -hmm. a history of your payments, you have the uh, prerogative to feel bad. I mean, I don't understand it, right? But at the same time, the guy, and we forgot about it. If I take him on face value, I would say yeah, he, he doesn't want to know. He trusts us. So if I can leave it at that, mm -hmm. or I can say, mm -hmm. man, no, I think we should go check our history and send him a screenshot anyway, yeah. because he's he's too polite, he's uncertain, right. and somewhere right. culture has come in the way of this man's peace of mind. Yeah. Right? 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 It's, so face. It's, it's face. It's face. Because if you challenge somebody's payment of you or something of the sort, it's potentially very embarrassing to the person that you're challenging. Right? Um, uh, so, for example, in a similar situation, imagine I, or and it's somewhat analogous, imagine I go to a restaurant and I, and at the end of the meal, I want to pay, I get a, I take out a credit card and I give it to the server and they try to use it in order to pay for my meal. And they realize that there's not enough, the, the credit card's been declined for some reason. They're not, they're, they're generally not going to stay in front of me and all, on all the people at the table. Oh, you know, Mr. Green, your, your credit cards have get, been declined. Do you have another one we could use? Because that would be very embarrassing to me. And why is that? Well, I think that we normally assume that people are able, competent adults are able to handle their money without having to raise any questions about it. And um, that's different from, do you want the salad or do you want the sandwich? That's something that somebody's got to decide. But can I pay for the meal that I've gone, ch chosen to go out for? If I can't do that, there's something deeply wrong. Maybe many people assume there's something deeply wrong with me if I don't know what my finances are like. So I think the issue there is like the server, like the delivery of the coconut water, um, an issue he didn't want to embarrass you by challenging your financial responsibility, you know, ability to be financially able able adults, even if there's no one else around, he was still too polite to, to potentially challenge your social standing. That is to say what I called earlier the notion of face. But I think that's what's going on there. It's two similar cases in which we we sort of beat around the bush. The server might say to me, excuse me, I'm very sorry, but I, could you please, you know, that sort of thing. I'm sure you've seen that kind of thing happen. I think what drives that is the is the issue of being polite and in particular the desire that we don't want to we don't want to damage one another's social standing unless we really have to. But, but uh, uh, I understand. I understand what you're saying very well. But uh, Professor Green, don't you think that we are somewhere becoming too sensitive? Mm -hmm. Because I, I'm an adult, right? 
I am, uh, and we are talking about sophisticated thinking. So if someone comes and asks me something, if my culture is not about, oh, don't touch, oh, don't speak harshly, oh, don't do this. If that's not yeah. the thriving culture around, but the culture around me is, you should know how to articulate, you should know how to speak. You can say, mm -hmm. let me check. And there is, when is loss of face? I mean, it's taken for granted. It's accepted that it's going to happen as if it's like, if you cut my arm, it's going to bleed. It's not like that. That's at least what I feel. And sometimes I feel that this kind of stretches a conversation unnecessary. It's still not resolved between us and him, right? right? We've right. not got a response from him. We've right. sent him the screenshot and everything. So sometimes right. I feel in some situations, I understand. But in all mm -hmm. situations, just because it exists mm -hmm. and we, mm -hmm. we are, we're too late back to really articulate our thoughts and say like he could have said yes ma'am please sure. check like you know in sure. a very decent way and That's i would right. say you know what i'm That's saying right. that just by promoting sure. this For culture sure. we might be becoming too sensitive like <laughs> crawling yeah. babies so it's, it's one thing to say that generally speaking in modern societies we try to respect one another's face that is our social standing it's another thing to say that all cultures and subcultures do it equally well and equally effectively. And there's certainly been situations in which I've been in, which I wish I, I would just say, could we please cut through the politeness here and just get to the point and say what needs to be said? Because we're wasting our time dancing around, mm -hmm. you know, the subtle issues here. And, and, and so, so I've certainly been in that situation. And I certainly understand how you feel that, that we can sometimes be too polite. I guess I'd say, instead of trying to add you know, trying to make a sort of global change in our culture or something like that. It seems to me, at least in my experience, it's helpful to try to establish strong trust and relationships with the people that we deal with so that if somebody needs to tell us some hard truth or potentially raise an issue, they feel comfortable doing so. Yeah. Of course, people who are very shy and are very, very, you know, respectful of social norms are going to be difficult to get there. But, but it's always good to, I mean, I always try to indicate with people that I have interpersonal daily dealings, and shops and so forth, that I'd rather they said it to me straight mm -hmm. than three, you know, levels of uh, indirectness and so forth. Because generally speaking, I just don't think I'm smart enough to figure out all the <laughs> subtle innuendos and suggestions. I feel like I'm going to miss something. I'd rather you said it explicitly. Yeah. So I certainly share your, your feeling. I don't feel that going around saying, you know, people are too polite and so forth is likely to make any difference because these are phenomena that are driven by, you know, by things that are well outside of our control. But I would say that in our in our circles of people that we have relatively frequent interaction with, it is possible sometimes to, to signal that you'd rather they said something to you directly than, mm -hmm. than have it be indirect. And I always try to tell people that I work with and so forth that, that um, saying it straight is just fine yeah. with me. I, mean, I, I generally try to tell people, if you want to hurt my feelings, you're going to have to try really hard. It can't be done, but you have to try really hard to hurt my feelings. And if you do, I'll let you know. Until then, I'm going to just be grateful to you for uh, saying saying what needs to be said, because that generally right. speaking is right. and you can One can understand why uh, things are difficult, because like everything else, to establish that kind of relationship, you know, it, it takes time. It takes effort. It takes and, and trust. And yeah, trust. to build that trust, you know, to find exactly. the right words to say and to back it up with action. All of that exactly. takes time. And then then another observation one can make because everything becoming digital, right? And so the one-on-one -on -one interaction is anyway go going down. Do you think now, anyway, we are not the best, uh, uh, you know, always best at conveying ourselves well. And with this coming and uh, we are, uh, it's very useful. You know, you're sitting at home, you're making payments uh, here and there and everywhere. Sure, it's convenient, sure. it saves you time. Mm -hmm. But is mm -hmm. are we going to lose something that uh, we do not really know what it is that we're losing? And once it's lost, we, do, we would not know what it is that we've lost. I mean, <laughs> it's... Well, just the pleasures and pitfalls and challenges and surprises that come with face-to-face -face interaction. And, and it know, prepares you for more. something bigger, right? Like if you are able yes. to hold your own in a, in, a, in, a, in a sticky situation, you know, like once we were in a bus and uh, uh, we had, uh, we were in Bangalore and in Bangalore, they don't speak the language my husband and I speak. And this okay. bus was full of uh, bus conductors and uh, uh, my husband gave the money and they were supposed to give back some, uh, you know, some change in return okay. and they mm -hmm. did not. And he got mm -hmm. up and uh, he said, well, he knew what, where he was. Yeah. So he knew he, we are, uh, we are two members in a, and mm -hmm. there's a majority of bus conductors. So mm -hmm. he asked for it. And then uh, there was a brouhaha 
you know, some <laughs> bit of it broke up. Yeah. And they, they were just generally angry and he became the uh, uh, focus of their anger. But yeah. he was able to deal right. with it because somewhere, okay. you know, like I said, like somewhere because of actually daily practicing within mm -hmm. with your partner, with your friends, mm -hmm. by yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. I think it's to take language seriously to that extent because you never know where it could land you into a soup and where it could take you out of a problem. I think uh, okay. just that everybody should take their language seriously. And like we were talking about ideas, language, if you start going deep within language, any language, it is so conceptual. There are so mm -hmm. many there are so many concepts in a language, how words come together in English, you know, how words come together in Hindi. Suddenly you begin yeah. to, because it's, it's, it's like telling you how, how perhaps to go about things. It's not limiting mm -hmm. you, but mm -hmm. it's setting you on a path. You can choose points to- Points you in a certain way. Mm. Points you in a certain way. Yes. Right, right, right. no question about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it takes, I mean, you know, with between, between the rise of the digital era where we can do so much of what we want to do online, and COVID over the last couple of years, having a face-to-face -face conversation with other people is becoming more and more rare and more and more challenging in some ways. And I think many people have the experience as things open up again, in, uh, at least in the West, people find that it's a little bit strange to have face-to-face -face conversations with other human beings as opposed to do everything online. It's a good thing to get back into, but it takes a little bit, a little bit of time. But I think it's an important skill not to lose. I, um, I totally agree. And, yeah, and clarity in language is a big, big, big part of that, it seems to me. One question I would like to ask you is, are there any particular inquiries that you have in mind uh, that you would like the younger generation that's getting into philosophy of language or that's getting into linguistics to carry forward? The mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good question also, among many of yours. So it seems to me we have a great deal more still to be learned about the mechanisms by means of which we convey things that go beyond what we literally say, that's known as pragmatics, as opposed to semantics. There's a lot more pragmatics to learn. And I think students that are now starting to study philosophy of language and so forth, that will, will, there's still plenty of things to be discovered there. You brought up the issue of emotion as it relates to, to language, and, and that's an important topic. I've got a, I'm collaborating with a scholar from um, Switzerland who just finished his PhD, and he's got strong interests in the relationship between emotions and language and communication and meaning. And he and I hope to do some, some collaboration, and hopefully after I've done doing this, he'll continue on for another 30 years or something of the sort. So it'd be nice to see him continue on with that. And you know, many of my students, for example, are very excited about the so-called politics of language. That is the ways in which lang language can be used for deception of a population or for demagoguery. There are people who discuss things like dog whistles and various kinds of ways in which we gaslight our audiences and so forth. There's a great deal more to be learned about those phenomena. And I believe the next generation of students of this area are going to have a great deal, great many things to say about that. Um, I also think that we've got a lot to learn about the about the, the nature of language as it's used. I already talked about non-human animal communication. I also think we've got a great deal to learn about the nature of language as it's used by machines. There's been an increased interest in ways in which computers, robots specifically, might be might count as in some substantial, robust way as language users. Can they use language in anything like the significant way that we can? And what would count as an answer to that question? How would we go about settling that question? Is it hopefully not hopefully more than just a matter of definition? So I think we'll as, and as our machines get more sophisticated and more subtle and powerful in the ways of communicating with us. Um, Building them into our linguistic community in some sense will be a challenging and really interesting project. And I believe that students that are now starting in philosophy of language or related fields will probably find themselves more interested in issues that that, that, that set of technological phenomena basis. So a lot of exciting there, exciting things there too, as far as I can tell. Certainly. And okay, just a, a, a mini question here. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that uh, machines will truly become conscious when they're able to uh, use uh, the language uh, by themselves in a direction that might be unpredictable for the creator? That's a good question, I, but I don't know what it would mean for a machine to become conscious. That is to say, people talk about conscious machines, 
I'm not, I'm still not sure I've got a clear conception of what that is. So okay. I prefer to be conservative there and say, I think machines can probably be intelligent, but I would distinguish between consciousness and intelligence. I think you can have consciousness without much intelligence. I think you can have intelligence without much consciousness. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'd want to keep those things separate, but it does okay. seem to me that some self responsiveness, self-awareness is more of a sort of loaded term, self responsive responsiveness where one part of a machine can so to speak, keep track of what's happening elsewhere in the machine. That degree of self-responsiveness is something that machines already have. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll continue to have a great deal more of in the future. And that's going to give them a lot of power that we don't now fully grasp. So I think, I, I tend to think that consciousness for machines probably is not the right issue to be looking at, but rather intelligence, sophistication, ability to get the job done and so forth. I guess my thought is a whole lot of interesting questions can be raised about whether machines can behave intelligently before we start getting ourselves confused <laughs> by the issue of whether machines can, can achieve consciousness. Fair enough. I think it's just beyond our capacity at this point, at least, at this to point. make progress in. But intelligence, I think we've got a handle on. And I think that there's a, there's a great deal to be learned um, about what machines can do at that level. Okay. So my last question for you is, mm -hmm. As a philosopher of language, of language, what does silence mean to you? Silence where a place where words do not go. What does it mean to you? Excuse me. It means a number of different things. It's not one big thing that it means. So sometimes in a conversation, silence means um, I'd rather not say something here because if I do, it might hurt somebody's feelings. <laughs> So, so um, I was I was having lunch with some people a couple of days ago, and one person at lunch asked another person, "What do you think of so and so?" You're asking about a third party, and the person who was asked said, "I'd rather not answer that question." That's a form of silence, right? They uttered some words, but they were definitely marking the fact that they didn't want to answer a question. So, in that respect, it was silence. But of course, everybody else at the table understood that something, you know was uncomfortable that they were trying to avoid. So that happens. Sometimes silence is an indication, you know, imagine a couple of friends are driving on a long journey and they got many hours. Sometimes silence is, among other things, a signal that it's okay for us to be together. We don't need to fill up our time with words. That's a perfectly appropriate, perfectly, in many cases, very pleasant kind of experience. Yeah. Um, in other cases, silence is just the pleasure of not having thoughts in our minds, even if we're not in a social situation. So at the beginning, I, I teach a course called Know Thyself. And at the beginning of every class meeting, I have my students do what we call a meditative moment, where we are all silent and just listen to ambient sounds, for example, or bring a little, little bell and I'll, I'll a meditation bowl and I'll have it make some sound, for example. And that's a kind of silence, at least nobody's speaking. And the hope is that even if they're having inner speech chatter going on in their mind, what, what uh, people in some contemplative traditions sometimes call monkey mind. Mm. Students will come to realize that that's okay and they can just let it go and just em empty their minds as best possible. That's a form of silence as well. And it can be very refreshing and in some ways enlightening as well. It doesn't have to be mystical, but can still be a way of getting them grounded and more focused and so forth. So it seems to me silence has a number of different uses, some of which are communicative, like the lunch example I gave, others of which are just, are, are less communicative, but still in a way sort of expressive, like the car drive, the driving in, in the car for a long, long time, which we might not say anything, that can be expressive without necessarily communicating a thought. And then there are other cases in which science, silence can be just kind of a beautiful openness that doesn't necessarily require to be filled with chatter in one form or another. So, so, so I guess silence is a number of different things, all of which I, I value, <laughs> all of which I find, find interesting and, and powerful and potentially enlightening as well. Wow. <laughs> Professor Green, this was really uh, educational, very interesting. And I'm sure as I go back and forth, listening to the whole thing, there's, there are gems in there and there are a lot of things that I can, you know, much more uh, extract after a second listen. So I'd like to thank you for your time for all the knowledge you so willingly shared and uh, thanks for coming on. That's You're very welcome, it's a pleasure. And I learned from speaking with you. So it was, it was a, definitely a two-way street.
and I uh, look forward to watch you build your, uh, your, your collection of interesting conversations with people from across the world and different disciplines and so forth. It's great to see that coming together. And, and uh, I and the rest of the world are grateful for all your and your husband's efforts in, in uh, building, up, building up this process. So I think it'll be a great resource for people. Okay. And, and already is now and will continue to be in the future. So thank you very much. My conversation with Professor Green helped me understand the role language plays as one of the fundamental ways in which we interact with the world and ourselves. It also helped me appreciate how it evolves and refreshes itself with every generation and value the role it plays in helping us understand who we are. It would be wonderful to know your thoughts on the interview and if it inspired your worldview in any way. Thanks for being here. I will see you soon with another interesting mind, demystifying another interesting topic. Until then, take care.